There's such a strong presence of the Lord right now. I just pray it goes right through that camera. That everybody that needs a touch from God will feel it right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. presence of God just overshadows anything that we have in our life that might interrupt. Mm. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about a subject that most people don't want to hear about. <laughs> And I always say, okay, Lord, thanks loads. But the subject is discipline. And throughout the body of Christ, there's very little discipline. Individually, corporately, throughout the whole world. I've seen so many things that were the flesh. And then there's other times pastors make mistakes too. There's in a church where the presence of God was so strong and somebody got up to leave and the pastor said, don't you be leaving. And they were the bus ministry. They had to go get the buses. He didn't catch it. But more often than not, there isn't any discipline. Discipline lives. Are we all guilty of it? So the Lord is speaking, and he's saying things that uh, I can't even begin to tell you what he's saying. There's many right now that believe this is going to be a rough year. Prophetic words are going out. God gave me a word that there'd be an increase in the spirit realm. And I like that if his angel's coming to help me. How about it? Don't you get excited over that? Yes. But there's going to be an increase on the other side, too. You All you have to do is look on the news. If you do, I avoid the news. I get some headlines sometimes on my phone, and I look, but this one's murdered, or this one's gone in here, and this, it's... The evil is so thick out there. And the persecution is thick out there, too, of people really strong for the Lord. Even people on Facebook are being monitored. If they preach against sin, they're being shut down. Seriously. Even on YouTube, the same thing. You see, the, the one world government is coming together. I mean, it really is. You can talk about Republican, Democrat, Independent, Russia, all of it. It's all coming together. This week, I had my email hacked. I have a provider through a movie service I use, and I couldn't get into it. So I went in and they said, change your password, which I did. And then I got an email saying that somebody over in Algeria was using my email address. And then it happened again. Somebody in Russia. And somebody in another third world country. And this week I get a phone call. And I like to have fun with them. But it came up Jamaica. I don't really know anybody that lives in Jamaica, do you? And it came up, and this person on the other end said, Hi, I'm with Publishers Clearinghouse, and I knew it was a scam. See, they want to steal, kill, and destroy you. And I said, Oh, really? I own that company. Do you need a job? Oh. <laughs> and they hung up. But there's so many things going on out there that people are walking in fear and confusion and they're afraid of this, they're afraid of that. And God doesn't want us to have fear. But he does want us to live disciplined lives. And it starts in your own heart. It should be in the church. A shaking is going to go on in the church. There's going to be things this year you're going to open your mouth and go, oh, well, I never would have thought that about them. 
How about you? Anybody in here been tempted this week? Oh, yeah. I don't mean the, the bad stuff. How about tempted to eat wrong? <laughs> oh, but pastor, you know, that was just one time. Yeah, that day, and then the next day, and the next day. I'm going to step on my toes and your toes today because discipline is so important. It tells us in the scripture that if you're not disciplined or chastised, you're bastards. What? If you aren't disciplined and chastised, then you don't belong to God. Because God's going to correct us. He's going to use scripture and he's going to use the church preaching of the word to get us to change. You wonder why the church isn't doing its job. It's because it's so undisciplined. Even the music. And I'm not the best at music. But I'm sure not going to let some things come in a church, in this church anyway, and be played because it isn't Christ-like. If it starts making you do this, do you understand what I mean? We had a lady in our church years ago, and she had been a chorus girl before she got saved. She was about four foot ten. Sweet as sweet can be. But we had a musical instrument that had some rhythms in it. And if I played wrong rhythm, she would start doing this. And I thought, oh, I can't use that rhythm. And like that. You need to be careful of the music you listen to because it can pull you right back where you used to walk in sin. I grew up in the 50s and I like rock and roll. My feet are on the rock and my name is on the roll. Hallelujah! But some of these songs are so... They pull you right back. And then there's some, like all my exes live in Texas. Get grief. <laughs> or song, song, blue, everybody needs one. I don't need the blues. I want the joy of the Lord in my life. He's my strength. You have to watch what you play and watch what you listen to because it can set you up. Have you ever listened to a song and you started to cry? Oh, my. If it's bringing you to conviction, it's a good thing. Man, I used to love to dance in the world before I got saved. I mean, I liked it. I didn't drink, but I sure liked to go where they had dancing. And I could dance up a storm. Believe me, I still can. But I do it for Jesus now. But there would be, there was a song I really, really liked, and I wanted it. And there was a drugstore in town that had a bunch of music. And I went and bought this song, thinking it was the song, by Stevie Wonder, because I used to like his music. I'm just telling you, I've been down the road you're on. I ain't some prude, and I ain't some person that hasn't tasted all the evil things in the world. I've been there, but I repented. And the song was called Higher. He used to sing, your love lifted me higher. I liked it. But now he can sing it for Jesus. But when I got the song home, it, it was an off, it was a group that I didn't know, and it was the Imperials, and it was a Christian song. But I played it, and I started weeping. See, I got saved when I was 11, but I didn't have any teaching. Probably everybody in the church I went to drank. Probably they gambled. They were all involved with high upper class stuff. Come on. And I didn't know that a lot of that stuff was wrong. And you see, if you're not taught, you don't know what's wrong, you do what's wrong. Come on. That's the problem in the church. The pulpit isn't teaching you what's wrong. Seriously. I didn't know alcohol wasn't something I should have because Jesus made wine. And I used that scripture even though I didn't understand it. It was new wine, which is non-alcoholic. You ask an alcoholic, that's come off of it. How many times does it take? How many drinks to get hooked back again? Mm -hmm. One. One. I didn't know. I didn't know I shouldn't go out on Saturday night and have a good time and then go to church and sing in the choir on Sunday. Am I relating to anybody else here or am I the only one that was a sinner? 
But when I got in a church, things changed. That song broke my heart. Jesus made me higher. And there was another song in there. It was called Praise the Lord. When you're up against a struggle, it shatters all your dreams and your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes. And you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fear. Don't let the faith you're standing on seem to disappear. Praise the Lord. And I'd listen to that tape and I'd cry and I'd cry and I'd cry. And I didn't understand what was happening then, but the Lord showed me later he was cleansing me. And a lady in church, Bless her heart. She loved me enough to pull me into a one-on-one -on -one Bible study. And I'd go to her house, and the first scripture I saw was in the book of James where it said, Be you doers of the word and not hearers only. And as I read that, it convicted me. Are you just hearing it and not doing it? That's what I did all my life. I heard it, and then I went off and did my thing. But God used that song to convict me and bring me back. He disciplined me because he loved me. All those years that I was away from God, I could hear his voice speak to me. He never left me. He didn't like what I was doing, but he kept drawing me. He knew I'd go into that drugstore. He knew I'd buy that tape. He knew I'd listen to it. Don't give up on people that are on that track that's bad. Have you ever given up on anybody? God doesn't give up on you, but he will discipline you. Because if he doesn't discipline you, you're a bastard. That means you don't even belong to him. If you have no remorse over the things in your life that are sin, you better question whether you really have a true relationship with God. Because Father God will discipline us. It doesn't mean he takes a big stick and breaks your leg. But I am here to tell you, there's many times that he put me down so I had to get quiet. and Maybe I was sick so I could listen. Come on. Do we talk about that? Oh, God will heal you. God will touch you. Yes, he will. But he also will discipline you. What does the word discipline mean? All right. Jesus had disciples. Am I right? A disciple is a learner. It comes from the word mathetus. And the word disciple is used 27 times in the New Testament, but disciples, 241. So it's an important word. So what is a disciple? It's a disciplined one. Yesterday, we were at a funeral. The lady was 88. She loved Jesus, I'm telling you. She was radical. And she was very eclectic. She dressed like, I loved it, the colors, the hats. But she went home and they had a celebration of life. And I made a decision to eat better this year. Not a resolution, a decision. And after the funeral, they invited us to go to a restaurant. And I spoke to my husband. I said, I'll go, but I want to eat healthy. We've made a decision. Anybody else made some decisions? So I was put to the test, because this man paid for all the food. You could have what you want. You know, there was a lot of stuff on the menu. But I chose not to eat bad. The rest of the people, that was their choice. And don't you point fingers. I'm telling you, if you want to change life, you have to discipline yourself. And when you don't, God will discipline you. I had to go through a lot of things. I didn't know it was wrong to marry a non-believer. How about it, Albert? You're right. Does it work? No, it won't work. I didn't know. And when I got my heart right, he called me every name but nice. Well, you're one of them goody two-shoes now, huh? Come on. When you're unequally yoked, it isn't going to work. You need to discipline yourself that whoever you date, whoever you marry, better be a Christian and they better be on the same level you are because they'll pull you down. Yes. And I'm telling you something else. You better hang out with people that are Christians too because if all you hang out with is non-believers, they're going to pull you back. Yeah. 
That doesn't mean you don't witness. But spend your time with somebody that will pull you higher. Because you're hungry. Why are churches that preach truth not full? Because people don't want to hear it. They don't want to change. How about you? Do you really like to change? I don't. I like change. Yeah. I like dollar bills. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Most people detest having to change things that need to be changed drastically in our life. One of the things is our mouth. We need to change what we say with our words. Mm -hmm. And you hang around me long enough, ask Deborah. <laughs> you have something come out of your mouth that isn't lining up with the word, I'm going to nail you. Mm -hmm. I'll do it in love because I want you to succeed. I don't want you to go through what I went through. I wasn't taught as a kid. Oh, I went to Sunday school and we sang these songs and we gave our little dimes and nickels to the poor children overseas. But I wanted, I hope they'd send the liver over there too, you know. Isn't that what your mother told you? Oh, you don't need that. You know, there's children over there that, would, that are starving. You do all the religious things. But it didn't make any difference in my life. Yes, the seed was in me. Yes, I was saved. But I needed the kind of teaching from God that would change me. I had to discipline myself. Then there's the word chastisement. Boy, that sounds like a rotten word, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to chastise you, kid. No, it means the same thing as discipline. It means to tutor, to give disciplinary correction, instruction, and nurture. How many women in here had children? And men. And men. Well, you didn't give birth to it, but had kids. Did you ever pick up that baby and hold it? Did you love on it, or did you take it by the leg and swing it? I saw a lady do that one day. The kid wasn't walking fast enough, so she took his arm and was slinging him around. I said, lady, you better stop it. He's, you're going to hurt him. Don't be afraid to tell somebody when they do something wrong. Well, maybe you won't have any friends. I'd rather a kid's life was spared. Yes. But nurture. Pastors need to nurture you. And every one of you at a different level. Some of you got saved early. You had tremendous teaching. Some of you, like me, got saved early and didn't have anything. It went in one ear. It didn't really come out the other ear because it really didn't go in. It fell on ground and the cares of the world stole it away. I had to get my heart ready to receive the word. If your heart isn't pliable to receive the word, you're not going to get it. We have to discipline ourselves. And for years, I got up every day. My ritual was I'd get up around 6 o'clock, read the word for an hour or so. I would go swim for an hour and get exercise and I'd eat breakfast. And my day was going great. And I had a bunch of kids at home, so don't tell me it can't be done. I got up before they did. I disciplined myself. Then you get off track. Anybody ever, in here ever been on a diet? Yeah. Well, I'm going on a diet this year. That's a stupid thing to do. Just have lifestyle eating all the time. And know what's good for you and what's bad. Some things are bad. I learned when my late husband had dementia, what caused it was sugar. It messed his brain up. And every time he'd eat sweets, his blood pressure would go up. Oh, you had high blood pressure, you drink more water and eat less sweets. Come on. Then I learned anything that's white, stay away from it. That's bread, that's potatoes, and I love potatoes. Nothing like mashed potatoes, gravy, and a roasted chicken. But I had to discipline myself. Because I wanted to be healthier. How about it? Anybody in here want to be healthy? It's unfair to a spouse if you're married to not take care of yourself and then end up in a position where you can't do anything and they have to take care of you. You need to discipline yourself. How many of you ever look at somebody and think, oh man, if they just lost weight, how pretty they'd be. Well, what about if you lost a little weight in your tongue? Wow. I'm stepping on toes. We, we're nasty to people. Yeah. And some of the things we need to discipline, you might not even think about. 
I'm going to go over that today. Now, I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This word is so important, and it's verse 16. Well, let's start with verse 14. See, Paul, who is Timothy's spiritual father, calls him a son. We don't know much more than that. But 14 says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child, okay, child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Jesus, Christ Jesus. In other words, he was a child when he was taught the scriptures. You don't wait till somebody's a teenager. It's too late. You teach them when they're little. Every Jewish boy had to recite the first five books of the Bible when they were 13, Neither, either and able to be able to complete their bar mitzvah. How many of you could recite the first five books? Do you even know the names of them? Come on. So there he is. You study that scripture, it says, verse 16. All scripture, say all, all, is given by inspiration of God. And see, when this was written, it was a letter. There wasn't any New Testament at the time. It was the Old Testament. He says all scripture, including the New Testament, is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now that word instruction is the same word used for chastisement. So the word of God instructs us. It disciplines us. It chastises us. We read a word and it says something. When I saw that be he doers of the word, not hearers only, it chastised me. I immediately was convicted that I wasn't a doer of the word. I heard it, but I never did it. Maybe some of you are there also. But the scriptures are given. In Hebrews chapter 12, I want to go there. Hebrews chapter 12. Today we're talking about discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Hebrews 12, 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. This comes from Proverbs 3.11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth away every son whom he receiveth. If, say if, if. you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastens not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards, that means illegitimate, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, speaking of God, for our prophet, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Wow. It said, but now no chastening for the present seems to be joyous. How many of you ever were spanked as kids? Mm. Now some of you were abused. Yeah. I'm not talking about that. But it says right here, no chastening. For the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Oh, that hurt. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised or trained thereby. So see, disciplining, I didn't feel so good when it happens. But later, you'll be thankful. I'm so thankful that God disciplined me through that song. You don't know what will touch somebody's life. Nurturing. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Then we're going to talk about some things that have to leave today. Ephesians 6, verse 4. This is really important. You could put mothers here too. 
It says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You don't just beat a child into submission. submission. You nurture them. You train them. And it starts in the crib. We have kids come in our thrift shop that are so out of control because they've never been disciplined. Anybody been around there? I don't mean that they don't make noise, that's not it, but screaming and demanding that the mother give them something. I told one lady, I'll give you something, all right, here's a paddle. And you know what they did? They gave it to the kid to play with. <laughs> Seriously, that happened. <coughs> that's not what I meant, sir. People are afraid to do it. But I tell you what, mine learned, and it didn't hurt them, and I learned too. Amen? Now there's some things that God hates. Did you know God has a hate life? Mm -hmm. In Proverbs, chapter 6. Proverbs 6. Praise the Lord. If you're with me this morning, let me get an amen. 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 Proverbs 6, verse 16. I preached this one time, and the lady got mad and left church. She said, well, God doesn't hate anything. Yes, he does. He hates sin. He hates the sin in your life. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination. That's a horrible thing. Unto him. A proud look. Now, oh, wait a minute. That's not any great big thing. You ever met somebody that just looked down on you, had that pride in them? Proud look. A lying tongue. Anybody in here had a lying tongue? Mm -hmm. What I mean by that, have you ever looked at somebody and said, gee, you look nice and they really don't? Is that, is it really a white lie? Uh, Maybe you can be honest and say, uh, you know, uh, that might not be the best thing you can wear, like a blonde wig. <laughs> there might be something better for you than that. See, we don't think about that as lying, but we're lying. Oh, you look so nice today, Pastor, behind my back. Man, did you see what she had on? Did you know that her slip was shorn? Why didn't you tell her? Come on. A lying tongue. I'm nailing you all. Hands that shed innocent blood. Well, I haven't murdered anybody. I'm not so bad. Why would God keep me out of heaven? Abortion. That's innocent blood. God hates it. Why do you think judgment's coming on this nation? What did I hear the other night? 54 million babies have been aborted in this country. Now, if you've had one and you repented, that's gone. But God hates that. But he doesn't want you. You need to be convicted, not condemned. And if you've never repented, you need to. Because that will keep the flow from coming. We had an excellent woman on Thursday night, woman speaker, and she said that she refused to have children after an abortion because she felt so guilty all of her life. And man, she would have made a wonderful mother. She's a sweetheart. But see, you do the sin, and Satan condemns you the rest of your life. There's therefore now no condemnation for them in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if you've gone that direction, if you've murdered, if you've lied, get rid of it by repentance and be right with God again. It's over. You can't bring it back. But I will tell you this. Every baby aboard is waiting for their mother. There's a woman that lived up in Plant City. Granddaughter fell off a swing, uh, fell off a slide into a pool and smashed into the cement. The grandmother didn't know she was behind her and knocked her off. She went flying. The kid dies and goes to heaven. But they saw her floating like this through the air and settled gently. That child saw a young boy in heaven. Came back and talked to her mother. The little girl was three or four, very young. And she said to her mother, and her grandmother was there, I saw Mima's boy. And they thought she was talking about an uncle that had died. Because Mima didn't have a boy. She said, no, Mima's boy. And the grandmother went, she'd had an abortion and she'd never told anybody. 
And the grandmother said, oh, my boy, does he hate me? Mm. Oh, no, Mima, he loves you. They don't hate in heaven. Hatred's down here on earth. Those babies that were aborted are waiting for their mothers and their daddies, because daddies are just as responsible as mothers, because they wouldn't step up to the plate and marry a woman or be responsible. Come on! Come on. Yep. That baby, little girl, said, No, Mama, he loves you. It changed that woman's life, knowing what she'd done. She buried it. We buried some of the sin in our life. We didn't even want to talk to God about it. How could he love me? Look what I did. But it says when we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin and forgive us of all unrighteousness. Isn't that an awesome promise? The next thing. Heart that devises wicked imaginations. Anybody ever disliked anyone? Have you ever thought evil things about them? Oh, I wish they were dead. Gee, oh, how about when you say, well, what goes around comes around, you're going to get yours. You ever thought that about anybody? Come on, let's be honest. I have. I repent. Well, you're going to get your due. God hates that. That's evil speaking. We're to bless them that curse us. We're to pray for them that spitefully use us. Mm. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. <laughs> well, I want to tell you about a pastor. He was in this church for a while, and he didn't do a good job, and he's gone. That's feet swift to mischief. You better shut up. Gossip. God hates gossip. Anybody ever gossip? My mother was right. If you can't ever say anything good, don't say anything at all. She was a beautician. She worked in a beauty shop. She heard things that she never brought at home. I could probably have something on everybody in town that she worked on. Her <laughs> Hello? Feet that are swift. Well, I tell you what the pastor did, and the pastor did this. Spreading stuff about it. You better be careful when you talk against somebody that's anointed. Because right. people die. Careful! And if a pastor didn't do a good job in a church, it doesn't necessarily mean it was his fault. Maybe there's a bunch of dead wood sitting out there in the chair that don't want to change, and he wants to bring some life, and they don't want it. Be careful. You better be careful what you say. Feet that swift and running to mischief. Then a false witness that speaks lies. Oh. Lying tongue is one, but not a false witness. Twisting the truth. Isn't that what Satan did in the garden with Eve and Adam? Well, hath God said this? Making it look a little different. In other words, playing the blame game and blaming somebody else for your sin. Twisting it. A false witness. Standing on the under the authority of God and giving a false report. I remember I was living in Orlando and I get a letter from a friend of mine that lived where I used to live and I won't say where and they worked in a ministry for another pastor and this person sent me a letter full of gossip about a pastor and I knew it wasn't true and I called him up and said I think you better be careful what you do down at that ministry gossiping God hates it it's sowing discord discord among the brethren mm. discord and you know if we play the game of gossip I could start with Irene and say something. By the time it get into the back room, it wouldn't even be the same story. We've done this before, and some of the things that come back are like, wow, how did they ever get that? It'll always be twisted. If you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. And why am I telling you this? You need to get discipline in these areas. 
Anybody ever spoken about somebody behind the back? If you got a problem, you go to the person. You go to them and talk to them in love, in a spirit of gentleness, to try to get them back if they're in sin. I've had people say, do you know this about pastor? I said, well, I don't know. Why don't you go talk to him? <gasps> well, I couldn't do that. I said, well, if you want to know, he's the one that you're talking about. You need to stop the gossip. And I've had people in the church come to me and say, well, pastor, so-and-so told me not to tell anybody, but you need to know. I said, I don't want to hear it. I really don't want to hear it. People in the church are some of the worst gossips that ever were. I've gone out to lunch, and man, they're eating people alive. I'm stepping on my toes and yours. <coughs> Discipline. This is the first thing you need to let go, right there. What is that? Gossip. Gossip. Anybody guilty? Then we need to repent. How about this one? Failure. Anybody feel like a failure in their life? You need to let it go. I failed. I failed in a marriage. Oh, you were married before? Yes, I've been married three times. Both husbands before I did. Both of them got their heart right with God. Repent. It's over. Discipline yourself. Next one, bitter. Anybody in here ever been bitter? No. You need to get rid of it. Well, you don't know what they did. I don't need to know what they did. God said, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor be put away from you and be you with all malice. Well, I'd like, you know, if they were here right now, I'd just, no. You have to let it go. Anybody not hearing from God like you'd like to? Then maybe your pipe between you and God is clogged. Anybody ever had a clogged toilet? You got to plunge it. Maybe God's talking to you today. Maybe you're bitter with me. I forgive you. Next one. Liar. Who's the father of lies? The devil. The devil. So, whose family are you in if this is what you do all the time? The devil. Am I stepping on any tires? I didn't ask to preach this. But I'm going to be obedient. How about betrayed? Anybody ever been betrayed? Oh, yes. <laughs> you better repent of it. God's disciplining this morning. I want you to think about Jesus. He spends three years, three and a half years with these boys. Fishermen, tough guys. Teaching them, discipling them, telling them, no, 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 don't do this, don't do that. Go here, go there. Putting everything he had into somebody for those years. And every single one turned their back on him. He was despised. Rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He understands. He was betrayed. He knew he was going to do it, but he didn't say, he didn't put a big old S on Judas' shirt for sinner. No, he put the bread in the cup with him. Whatever you have to do, go do it. And they all say, he's the one of who's going to betray me. And they all look at each other. No one knew it was going to be Judas. Nobody. Because they all said, is it me? How about it? Have you ever betrayed God? Discipline. Chastisement. Poverty. Some of you have a poverty mentality. Well, it was the way it is with all the years in the family. You need to repent of that. God wants to pour his riches out on us. And it isn't all money. But you have poverty and faith. You might have poverty in your stinking thinking. Stinking thinking leads to sinking. Huh. Oh, here's a good one. Pornography. Boy, it's quiet in here. I remember one day I was looking up White House. Years ago on my computer, I had a business in Fort Myers. And I spelled house horse. 
by mistake, H-O-R-S, the Insta, H-O-U-S, instantly on my screen were three ladies naked on three white horses, and I went, ah, and I mean, I froze. And I thought, I don't want anybody to see this. I froze. Right there, I could still see it. That's what pornography does to you. You'll never get it out of your mind unless you have deliverance. And it isn't just men, it's women. And pornography doesn't belong in a marriage either. Am I stepping on any toes? <coughs> Anger. Anybody in here ever get angry? Well, look at all the liars. I didn't see any hands go up. Anybody in here ever get angry? Mine are up. Discipline. And all bitterness, wrath, and anger. Do you love me? Yes. Envy. Ah. Uh, anybody wish they had something somebody else had? Maybe ministry. Oh, I wish I had the money they oh, I wish I had the car they had. I wish I had the house they have. Oh, I wish I well you know what? I've been in ministry forty years and I don't have what they have. How come God? That's envy. That's sin. You gotta get rid of it. Maybe it's in your family. You're envious of somebody else. Strife. Oh. <laughs> Just not getting along with somebody. Now you can have boundaries, all right? But don't, okay. Have you ever had a situation? Come on back, bro. You ever had a situation where you saw somebody did something and you could trip them up and make them look like a real jerk? Come on. And God goes, uh-uh. You know what that means, right? Zip your lip, but you speak it anyway, and you know it's going to cause a problem. Years ago, my daughter called, and I've shared this before. Somebody she worked with did something that could cause her to be fired. My daughter found out about it, and she worked in the same place, and the girl got the thing right and changed it, and she called me. What should I do, Mother? That's what kids do, and if you're godly, you should have godly advice. I didn't say, well, you know, she should get what she deserves. I said, did she make it right? Yes. I said, well, he that seeketh love covers sin. Be slow to expose people's weaknesses, people. It causes strife. Boy, it's quiet in here. I'm not getting amens and hallelujahs. I think God knows what we needed to hear today. And whoever's watching this, you turned it off, well, you better repent too. How about rebellion? Well, I'm not going to do what the pastor says. I don't care who they are. <laughs> I'm not going to do what my mother and dad said. I remember when I was 22, I had two little tiny kids went to a meeting to learn about babies. This woman said, well, just because your mother made the bed this way doesn't mean you have to. Just because your mother told you to do this doesn't mean you have to. And I thought, well, my mother taught me some good things. Why would I throw that out? She was trying to get people to rebel against the right things. It's going to be against sin. But do you know that rebellion, that means not doing what you're supposed to do when you're told to do it, is as a sin of witchcraft. The church is full of witchcraft. Yep. Because people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'm, you're not going to tell me what to do. A pastor's job is like a shepherd. If they see a sheep doing something they shouldn't, the shepherd goes and tries to bring them back. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that what you do? Or if the sheep is off and going, they're going to try to pull them in. The reason being that one by themselves out there is more vulnerable than in the flock. Plus, the shepherd wants the sheep to feed on the right kind of food so that they'll, they'll be healthy. I didn't get any food. It's a wonder I didn't starve spiritually as a kid and a young adult. 
How about the rest of you? Did you go to churches as young people where you really got filled up with good stuff? Here's the next one. Mm. Well, I'm glad I'm not like them. Is that one of the things here? Proud look. Mm. We already went over that. Oh. <laughs> I'm covering it all, aren't I? Fornication. That means having sex when you're not married. But I, I, yeah, <laughs> that's fornication. That needs to be discipline. Word of God says if you, you burn, you need to get married. Period. You need to discipline yourself. What about this one? Some people don't just love that lust after the opposite sex. They lust after food. They lust after things. More and more and more. Never getting enough. Lust comes in many, many ways. But we have to be disciplined. How about jealous? That goes along with envy. Anybody in here ever been jealous? I remember years ago, this lady had a tremendous voice. And before I had thyroid surgery, I could sing better. But I could still sing. I can make a joyful noise. But I want, I, she had such a beautiful voice, I just was jealous. Ever been jealous? Let it go. Be disciplined. Call it what it is, sin, and get rid of it. How about stress? Have anybody have stress? Mm -hmm. He says to cast all your cares on him. Boy, am I nailing anybody? I had stress. Finally, I said, you know what, Lord? You're going to have to make it work because I can't do it. It's up to you. I just give it to you. If it goes, it goes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And just be kind and sweet in the meantime. Stress. It's sin. He said, be, did you know that stress can bring fear? Fear brings, here it is, fear. Anybody have any fears? Oh, look at the eyes thinking. Mm. Are you afraid of what might come down the road with bad stuff? I'm not. Because I tell you what, bad stuff comes and I'm killed, I know where I'm going. Good stuff comes and I'm not killed, I still know where I'm going. Fear brings torment. Anybody ever felt tormented? Yes. Oh. Well, what about fear for your kids? What are they going to do? How is this going to happen? Can you trust God? Fear is the opposite of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. It doesn't say without fear, it's impossible to please Him. We don't need to be afraid of God. Then there's hatred. Oh, I can't stand that person. You ever been like that? I had somebody say to me, someone came to church, well, I just don't like the way they look. Well, you don't even know them. You might not like the way I look. <laughs> Revenge. Oh. Did I nail you, Irene? No. <laughs> Revenge. Well, I hope they get what's coming to them. Honey, let me ask you a question. If you got what was coming to you, where would you be? I'd be in hell. But while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. He that knew no sin, sinless, took all my garbage, feces, and put it on himself so that I could be free. I have no right to have revenge. Idolatry. Well, I don't have any statues in my house I worship. I have to tell you, there was a neighbor of mine that loved Jesus. They were good Catholic people. And I'm not going to knock the church, but they had a crucifix on the wall. And every night, they had the boy pray to the crucifix. And one night, the mother said, well, you need to pray. And he said, God, this is according to the kid, God don't answer prayer. Well, sure God does. God don't answer prayer. Yes, he does. No, he doesn't. God don't even have batteries. 
Praise the Lord. No batteries. He thought the crucifix was God. That's idolatry. See what we do? She trained him to pray to the crucifix. We need to teach children to pray to the God you don't see. The God that does change things. The God that disciplines us. The God that loves us enough to say, Helen, you've got to change. I heard that and I laughed, but it isn't funny. I often wonder whatever happened to that kid. I hope he grew up. You know what, though? That's the kind of thing that pulls people out of church. Because they go there and there ain't no batteries there. I'm telling you what. When we get plugged into Jesus, and that power of God comes in our life, there's nothing like it. We need to teach, G, teach these children that God's powerful. When my kids were little, and you can say it was a wrong thing, but I don't think it was, they might get sick. And the first thing I asked them, did you do anything wrong? We opened the gate. Yes, what'd you do? Well, uh, okay, let's ask God to forgive you. Okay, so we prayed a little prayer. I trained them young. We prayed and they get healed. Man, when I started to learn that I could lay hands on the sick and they recover, things changed in my house. Because I had two kids with asthma and they were sick all the time. What about you? What's keeping you from getting your healing? Maybe you have a lack of faith. Maybe you've gossiped. I get really angry when people share things that I tell them in confidence. Did you repent? Maybe you have hatred in your heart. Today's the day to get rid of it. We're going to take communion. And in the Word of God, it tells us that many sleep or are dead because they didn't rightly discern the body of Christ. And that isn't just speaking about Jesus' literal body, it's speaking about everybody in the body of Christ. Who is it that you've offended? Who is it that's offended you? Who is it that you're bitter about? Because I'm telling you, there's not one of us that could stand before a holy God without Jesus' blood applied to our sin and, and get into heaven. We have to let go of some things. We have to be disciplined. We have to learn that we can't win if we're caught in all of this stuff that I just showed you. We don't need batteries. We have a direct line to God. It says, when I call upon him, he will answer me. Let's shut our eyes for a minute before we take communion. And if the two elders will come forward to help me, please, with the communion, Russell and Albert. I want you to shut your eyes and examine your heart. If there's some things in your life today that not condemned you, but caused you to be under conviction, I want you to raise your hand. I'll raise mine. Yes, there's hands going up. Don't look to see who else's hands are going up. All right. We examine our heart. We must have a pure heart and a pure conscience before we take communion. Let's all say this together. Father God, I have sinned against you in word and deed. Please forgive me of my sin. Wash me afresh and anew with your blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that your blood cleanses me now from all sin. I choose now to walk away from it, to not pick it up again. I lay it on your altar. I thank you, Lord, for disciplining me. I don't want to be a bastard. I want to be your child. Wash me, Lord, and I'll go forward in your power and your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we take the cup, 
And we take the bread. I want you to think about this. Jesus' body was broken. I can't even imagine a whip with nails and a whip with glass and pieces of stone slashed across his body and didn't just hit the back. I'm sure it swung around and hit him in the face. I can't imagine the pain. Chunks of his flesh were pulled out. Not just the whipping. Then when he was nailed to the cross, the pain of crucifixion, not being able to breathe. Then they took a crown of thorns like this right here and they shoved it into his head. Those things are that deep. The pain. But he endured the cross because he could see the glory beyond. What a savior. And as we take the bread and the cup today, we're reminded that he shed his blood and his body was broken for you so that your sin can be washed away but that your body can be healed. Because it says, by his stripes you are healed. This is the meal that heals. It isn't just some ritual we do. It's a reminder of what he did. So let's take the bread. If you look up at it, there's little holes in it. This is unleavened bread, which represents no sin in this bread. Leaven always represents sin. Those holes are for your salvation. Those holes are for your remedy from sin. Take and eat you all of it. When Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended up into heaven and put his blood on the altar. Every bit of his blood is on the altar. This represents the blood, but it doesn't change into his blood. His blood is up there crying out now for your sin. And as you take this, be thankful that God's washed your sin away with Jesus' blood. Drink you all of it. When Jesus had the Last Supper with the disciples, he knew that someone would betray him. There may be people that betray you too, hurt you, do things. Be quick to forgive. Be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to wrath. Get the garbage out and keep it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Shut that off for me. Now, before we go, 